am. <laughs> so I have no idea you hear me. Um, but my name is Lily Chidori Nova. I'm the undergraduate experience in open educational research. librarian at Rutgers University in New Jersey and um, I'm leading this presentation with Mandy. Mandy, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi everyone. I'm Mandy Goodset and I am Performing Arts and Humanities Librarian as well as our OER and Copyright Advisor at Cleveland State University in Ohio and I lead the Temptations cohort as well. Go to the next slide here. I can, do you want me to introduce this, Lily? <laughs> Maybe I'll go ahead. Um, so we thought we would start off uh, by just asking a question to get the conversation started. Um, I think a lot of us are facing new challenges when it comes to providing incentives for faculty to participate in our programs. And so we just thought we would start by kind of getting them out on the table um, so that we can see which ones we can address in our discussion. So if you feel comfortable, go ahead and type in the chat any particular challenges you face on your campus when it comes to offering faculty incentives to participate in affordability or open education initiatives. I already see no money, no money. <laughs> Dollar bills, lack of budget. <laughs> More dollar signs. <laughs> um, any other challenges people are facing? Yes, Diana, faculty overwhelmed with overload of teaching and committee obligations. Absolutely, so time issue. Yeah, promotion and tenure concerns where deans are saying focus on publishing and peer-reviewed journals. Yeah, Suzanne, even if we had money, we have to get faculty attention and they are already busy doing 5 million things and now moving their courses online. Uh, Philip, incomplete awareness of ins and outs of OER and driving uh, all inclusive. That's certainly something on my campus. Getting the word out, overwhelmed folks. Yeah. Yeah, time commitment. Changing to different content takes time, no matter what the new content is. Oh, well, even when we had money, faculty were not incentivized much by it. Yeah, concern with quality. That's another important one. And uh, bandwidth, our, our time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we are dealing with a lot of fires right now that we have to put out, and that's an issue as well. All right, so let's keep those in mind and see which ones we can address. We specifically uh, tried to address the money one, so um, I'm glad we did that. Uh, so the first uh, thing we would talk, we thought we'd talk about is kind of addressing the main method that traditionally is used to incentivize faculty, which is through awards and grants. I don't know if Lily, if you want to try this or you want me to plow ahead. Up to you. <laughs> All right, I'll go. I'll go ahead and go, and you can chime in in the chat if you want, Lily. So um, there are lots of uh, campuses across the country that offer grants of various sizes. I know on our campus. We have some money for grants, it's not that much. Um, one popular approach that uh, OTN has kind of used is offering mini grants. So um, the OTN way, which many of you know of, is to offer a small grant, maybe around $200, for faculty to just review an open textbook. And about 40% of the time, they then choose to adopt that textbook. So that can be a fairly low cost strategy. Um, you could have mini grants for other actions as well. So um, I've certainly seen examples of a small grant to participate in some sort of training, which then hopefully leads to adoption. Um, then there are also larger monetary awards, often for things like uh, adapting or actually creating uh, an open textbook or other OER. 
Um, and obviously that can be a very big incentive if you have the funds to do that. Um, and then of course there are non-monetary awards, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later, um, both teaching and uh, alternative awards as well. So that's all I have about that one. If Lily wants to add anything. Um, oh, and Lily helpfully posted some examples here of other institutions that have some sort of uh, award program. And some of them you can see have money attached to the award and some of them do not. So feel free to check out those links. And we, the slides will be available. They should be available to you afterwards. And I'm gonna read what Lily is saying. Mini grants are most common and the word grant is problematic. That's a great point. So if you start administering these, you might wanna stick with award. Mini grants require uh, little reporting requirements. Yeah, so that's a great point. So um, on some campuses, if you use the word grant, there are all kinds of issues and there's paperwork and um, sometimes it's just not possible. Like you're not allowed to do that <laughs> on your campus. On my campus, there's no issue. So we do call them grants. So it depends. Um, sometimes being able to say you are you were awarded a grant can be really a powerful thing for some faculty. But as I said, if, if there is an issue on your campus, you want to be wary of that. Um, yeah, and they're not great at incentivizing all types of faculty. Yeah, great point. Caroline, question. How do you distribute grants and mini grants? Do they go to the department or to the professor? That's a great question. And I think it's certainly going to be institution specific. For us, we are able to do it because we use, um, we use discretionary funds from the library. So we administer the grants and we manage them and we decide who gets them. But I think it would depend on who's kind of coordinating the grants. Um, I have heard of programs, most of the programs I've heard of go to a specific professor or like even a small team, but I have heard of department level grants where, um, oh, and this is, this is kind of next level, I wish we could do this, where basically the students do pay for the OER, a small fee, but all of the money goes back to the department and that creates an incentive for the department to put in the work to try to get faculty to switch. And then they can use that money for professional development or whatever their department needs. So even if it's like $5 or $10, there's some controversy about that because now we're charging students again and um, that's what we're trying to get away from. But for a department that's, uh, like I have a department, they're used to actually getting a cut of what the students pay for the textbook they require. And so for them, we've been trying to use this as a solution to deal with that. Yes, Kansas State, thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, I think it's Rebel that does that at Kansas State. Well, she used to be there. Tanya, they work directly with payroll. Yeah, leaving it up to the department to decide how to, to distribute it, yeah. These are great ideas. And I think, you know, I would venture to say there are people on this webinar who would be happy to, to talk with you if you wanted to reach out to anyone um, about how they manage it. Yes, yeah, she's in Florida now. Rebel is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. So Jeannie says that there's is uh, to the department. So maybe that's another way around the grant issue. Um, thanks, Cheryl. Cheryl put the link to uh, that program there. So, so lots of creative things you can do with even just a small amount of money if you can. And Lily says, um, important to think of the mini awards as just incentives. They're not meant to pay faculty for doing the work. At least it's how we treat them here and I find that helpful. Yeah, that's a great point. And I've heard this kind of discussion in the open education community, like do we need to incentivize faculty to do the right thing? <laughs> that seems kind of icky to use that term. Uh, so it's not, it can be considered not as much as an, an incentive as kind of um, reimbursing them for the labor that they have to put in to do this work. Yeah. All right. So I think this came up as one of the barriers someone mentioned, but one thing that can be really challenging in 
um, working with faculty on open textbook projects or OER projects is that they're, if they're pre-tenure, they're under a lot of pressure to spend their time doing the most valuable thing for them, which is activities that will help them get promotion and tenure. And on many campuses, those activities do not include writing a textbook of any kind, much less um, putting in a bunch of work to write an open textbook. So uh, it's a really big challenge for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that, at least on my campus, those decisions are made on a department by department basis. And so trying to make a change is really slow work. Um, and also, for understandable reasons, faculty don't really want outsiders kind of coming in and deciding how people will be tenured in their department or in their profession. They want to establish um, the standards for excellence for their own field, and that makes sense. So, um, and of course, even if they are on board, everything in academia just takes a long time. So making these sorts of changes is extremely difficult. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. There may be kind of like sneaky other ways that we can uh, help them get that credit where they deserve it. And one way is through teaching awards or teaching grants. So many campuses, the way that promotion and tenure is determined, at least part of it is based on teaching. And the main source of evidence for that is often teaching evaluations, which I don't know about your campus, but on my campus, faculty really don't like to be evaluated on teaching evaluations. They think that they are biased or inaccurate. And so um, it's, they are often very interested in finding other sources of evidence that they are committed to student success. Um, and one way to do that is through a teaching award. And I know on my campus, there are not that many teaching awards. They're very competitive. Faculty really want them when they're committed to teaching. And so that's something that you can offer is a teaching award around open education um, and or open pedagogy. And for um, that, that, because it has that value for promotion and tenure, it does not even have to have a financial component at all. It can just be a plaque or just even just a name, you know, you won this award. And that's something that they can put on their CV, put in their dossier. Um, on my campus, we have a teaching award that is coordinated through our Student Government Association. So the students actually pick the winner of the award, which I think is really important. And they are the ones who buy a little plaque and give it to them <laughs> as a thank you. So it's a very positive thing that um, allows the students to show their gratitude for a uh, faculty member's decision to um, use an open textbook. Another thing you can do is see if you can get a letter of recognition or some other kinds of kind of recognition from your administration. Um, and I have a link there. We were interested in doing this and we put out a call on one of the lists and uh, University of Alaska Southeast uh, volunteered their letter, which is openly licensed and we modified it a little bit. And so I have it linked there if you are interested in using it. It's of course openly licensed, but essentially, um, this is not like a costly thing or even a very time consuming thing. It's just a letter saying thank you for prioritizing student success. We value this sort of activity on our campus. Signed, important administrator, you know, provost or president. Um, I haven't tried it, but and in our state in Ohio, we've even been told that we can get a letter from the Ohio Department of Edu Higher Education Chancellor if we request one. Um, because at the state level they value open education. So that's another area you might look if your state is already doing, you know, passing legislation or doing things um, actively to promote open education. There, there may be a willingness to write a letter of appreciation for your faculty, you know, if it's just a matter of signing a letter that is not a huge commitment. And then of course there's the really tricky thing which is changing policy which as I said is challenging, but it's not impossible. And there are campuses who have been able to change their promotion and tenure policy. Um, I linked uh, in the word ideas. <laughs> um, last year we had an actual little round table at, at our in-person part of the certification um, just about this issue of promotion and tenure. And so I kind of compiled the, uh, <laughs> the responses. There are not that many things uh, written about this, but we compiled what we could find. And so you're welcome to look at that and please feel free to add your own ideas. Um, it seems like the most well-known publicized example of this is at UBC. 
British Columbia, um, they actually were able to change their policy and they got a lot of great PR from it. So um, that can be a model for us all to strive for. <laughs> all right. Thank you to Cheryl for posting these helpful links. Uh, kind of along the same lines, we can also incentivize this a little bit with faculty by talking about the opportunities for research, teaching, and professional development, which can help them um, in the promotion and tenure process. That's something they can add to their CV, and it also allows them to kind of stand out as a shining example in their own discipline among their peers. Uh, so, I linked there the video that Jeannie made about the COOP framework. You know, telling your faculty about the COOP framework might not be a bad place to start uh, if they're kind of wondering, how can I turn an open education project into a research project? Um, I also linked here this guidebook. I really like it. Uh, it's from the Open Education Group. Um, it's a guidebook on research uh, um, on open education educational resources adoption. And I think you can order it or somehow we, we were able to get a bunch of print copies. And so anytime we have a grant winner, we, as part of our meeting with them, we give them this guidebook and we explain how they can turn their project into some research. And they really like that. That makes them excited. Um, so this is something you could easily share with faculty who seem like they're interested. Um, and that's for, uh, both kind of looking at student success and, and those sorts of metrics and also reporting on um, open pedagogy projects and the innovation in the classroom that's possible when using open educational resources. There is just like a treasure trove of things that they could uh, say about that. And I think it's a really hot topic, I think right now especially, and a lot of disciplines are looking to publish about that. Um, and so you can, I, am, I feel free to tell my faculty, like, this is something popular that you could present about, so you should think about it. Um, I also wanted to mention that, sorry, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Oh, yes. Also, the uh, I think we may have mentioned this before, the Open Education Group has all kinds of resources that you could send uh, to faculty, examples, um, templates, you know, a whole list of research in this area that they could take a look at. Um, they're all, they also have a fellowship program, which unfortunately I think the applications just closed like last week or something, but you know, it's meant to be for people who are, are researching the use of OERs in the classroom. And you know, that could be your faculty and that could be a big draw to be able to say they are a fellow, an open education fellow. Um, this all also opens up opportunities for you to collaborate with your faculty member on my campus. We have our first year writing program is awesome and they've switched to an open textbook. And the two instructors who are kind of taking the lead wanted to present about it at their international conference. And they asked if I would um, present with them which was so great because they needed someone who could speak about just the basics of open education and um, open licenses and things like that. And so, you know, you can offer that as something uh, in addition to this general guidance about research, you can offer your expertise as well um, when they're out presenting or when they need to write a lit review or whatever, um, you can collaborate. And my last point here, and then I will move on, is that if you do hear about faculty who are publishing, absolutely try to keep track of that and then like make a big splash when they are published, share it with um, the campus community, share it with their colleagues and really spread the word around because it's exciting and you know, it's great to give them some additional attention for that work that they're doing. So now, um, other sources of influence. Unless Lily says otherwise. Okay, oh great, Lily has some notes here. Um, she says, we struggled with what to name the slide, but the point is that money is nice, but there's a whole ecosystem of incentives that you can tap into and which is more effective for certain types of faculty. Absolutely true. For instance, in Lily's research, she found that money is a good incentive for PTLs. Is this uh, part-time? Part-time lecturers, great. 
uh, let's face it, they should be getting a lot more of it. Absolutely true, <laughs> but not so much for tenured faculty. Yeah, that's a great point. So you may take some time and consider for the particular faculty you're trying to reach, is money really going to be uh, the best incentive or is something else going to be more effective? Um, so we have some examples here of non-monetary ways of uh, kind of supporting faculty in embracing open education, faculty learning circles. Um, I know that there are there's at least one video on the OTN YouTube page about this, um, but essentially providing support, peer support, and opportunities for faculty to learn more um, so that they feel more supported. Um, I'm going to read what Lily says. The point is that you want to tailor your incentive to its audience. I have found that getting the department and higher administration to rhetorically support an initiative can be much more meaning, meaningful. Yeah. The recognition that the work is important is just essential. That's okay. Doing great. Time we got a tiny screen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, if there's, I think if there's a perception from faculty that no one values this in your in your campus, then why would they spend the time to do it? They'd have to be really dedicated from the beginning. So it's really important. Thank you, Cheryl. You're so good. She found a Learning Circles video and, and put it there. So please feel free to look at that in the chat. Um, so yes, higher level administrative support, super important. And student activism, absolutely important. I know, um, you know, we have been trying to do things on my campus to give students a voice in this conversation because in the end, it's, it's their success that we're all working toward. Um, and Lily says, faculty want to hear success stories from students as well. A little bit of healthy pressure from students can go a long way. Yeah, I think faculty, um, even just students raising awareness, like this is expensive and this is a burden to me, can be um, something that they may not have thought about before. Thanks, Diana. No problem. All right. Lily says, I bet students will be very motivated in the coming months. Affordability of education is a central issue. Absolutely. If there was ever a time <laughs> to put a little pressure, now might be the time. Yes, I want to read Arenthia's comment. Yeah, so Renthia says that there was some money available to pay faculty to come in for summer training institutes and boy did a lot of previously unseen faces pop up this summer. So maybe money is the incentive that will work. Absolutely. Yeah, we actually had a very similar experience. We decided to offer um, a symposium, which is kind of like a training with a commitment to adopt at the end. It's only $600. And we were just like swamped with applicants and all these people I have never heard of before. So <laughs> I think um, also on our campus, there's an awareness like money is tight. I want a piece of the money. <laughs> so um, Cheryl says campuses can encourage students to comment on textbook affordability and teaching evaluations. That's a great idea. Praise teachers who offer zero cost course materials and raise concerns about expensive materials and courseware. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you know, if we are in part relying on um, course evaluations for things like promotion and tenure, students can absolutely help by saying nice things about the course content itself in their student evaluations if they appreciate uh, the lower cost, which usually they do. Is there anything else, Lily, for this slide? I'm going to keep going and let her add. We covered it. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about like public recognition and public gratitude. And uh, I did a, a webinar about this like on Monday for the Michigan ACRL chapter. So if anyone is interested in like a deeper dive, um, I'm happy to share the link to that. I have not gotten the recording yet, but it should be here soon. But anyways, here's some ideas for how you can just use like uh, 
social pressure or just, you know, recognition from peers as a way to kind of encourage faculty to get involved. Uh, so for those who uh, missed it at the OTNSI kind of virtual event, there was a session about textbook hero profiles. Um, Josh Bullock from KU uh, covered it and it was really excellent. I highly recommend it. It's linked there in the slide. Uh, but one thing they did that I thought was great was they created these little textbook hero profile pages for the faculty who were really big advocates of their initiative and were really involved. And it's not really that expensive or difficult to just to create this little page with you know, their photo, a little quote from them. But this is something now that they can link to in their CV or on their personal website. Um, and it's also something you can direct other faculty to, hey, check out what your colleague is doing. And um, here's someone you can even maybe contact if you have more questions. So kind of a public uh, thank you through a profile. Thanks, Cheryl. I knew Cheryl would pull through with the video. <laughs> um, one thing we tried on my campus before everybody got sent home was we made door hangers. And that link will, uh, or that image will take you to uh, the design that you're welcome to use if you want. Um, really inexpensive to create door hangers. You just buy a bunch of blank door hangers and then you print on them. And that's something you can put on many, many people's doors. You know, we put it on people's doors who we had heard were not using a textbook or were using a library licensed ebook instead of a, you know, an expensive textbook or whatever. And, you know, when you go down the hall, if you get a big enough list of people on your affordability advocates list, you can see a lot of door hangers and that kind of can signal to other people, other faculty, that there is support for this sort of thing on your campus and there are a lot of people already involved. So it's not just a passing fad. Um, another thing that I think will become increasingly important is using social media. So Open Education Week is in the spring. Open Access Week is in the fall. Uh, you know, you can post a little thing each day of the week. We did that for Open Education Week. Each one, we featured a different faculty member. Here's how much they are saving their students. And at the time, we were able to take a photo with them <laughs> in person. But um, that isn't necessary to do something like that. Um, but now you have kind of a big audience for thanking this faculty member for what they do. Um, we also created a little video. This was about a year ago now. And instead of featuring students, I think it's really common to have videos where students talk about the burden of uh, textbook costs. I think those are really effective and great. We decided to focus on, this, on faculty and feature them and the work that they're doing as a way to kind of model how others could do this work too. Uh, so you're welcome to look at that. It's only about six minutes or so. and. It took many, many hours <laughs> to put together the short six minute video. Uh, so just a caveat, videos are not quick to make. Um, I wanna read Tanya's comment. Yes, Tanya, I called Creative Commons, ordered a bunch of t-shirts, I love it. They asked for a I asked for a discount and they gave it to me. I would have ordered OTN t-shirts, but I found out that we aren't big on swag. It's okay, I was amazed how much faculty wanted those t-shirts. That's a great idea. We have had a faculty member ask if, if they could wear like a pin or something like, I use an open textbook, ask me about it or something like that during open education week. Um, obviously, we got to get creative <laughs> going forward because people will not see others walking around with a pin. Um, one idea I had was, could you make a little badge for faculty profile pages? I, all of our faculty have an official profile page, but maybe we create a badge for them that can go on their page that says, uh, affordability advocate or you know got to get creative um, finding online ways of thanking them yeah Meg I was thinking about badges for LMS or course site yeah absolutely places where people are gonna see it online um, so the last idea I thought I would share uh, we wanted to make some thank you cards from students saying hey thanks for thinking about your the cost of your textbook we decided on these big posters actually and um, you know if we just ask students randomly to sign this thank you poster, I was worried that uh, we wouldn't get a lot of insightful comments. I think a lot of our students still don't know what an open textbook is, frankly. So what we decided to do was ask our student government association to sign on behalf of all the students because I had presented to them multiple times and they knew who I was and they knew the deal. 
Um, and they wrote such wonderful little notes on here. Um, thank you for using a free textbooks. My pockets appreciate it. Um, one of them says like, tell your colleagues or something like that. So um, that was really sweet and thoughtful. And if you were gonna do something like that online, you could do something like have students record like quick little thank you videos. You know, they can do that on their phone pretty easily. Um, you could gather, you know, thank you messages, like little stories from students. Um, I think it's helpful if you compare it with like a photo of them. So it seems more real and like put those on social media or put them on your website or whatever. So thank you messages from students, I think are a really positive way for them to contribute to your campaign and provide that additional incentive for faculty to get involved. Okay, so I've been talking a lot. Um, is there anything that you wanted to add Lily or anybody else before we have a bit of discussion time? Thanks to everybody who contributed ideas in the chat. Okay, Suzanne has a question. I'm wondering if the societies and accreditation bodies are or are not tackling open education and textbook affordability. If faculty hear that it's important to student success, I think they'd be more encouraged to invest time if they're getting any encouragement from their peers in their fields. That's a great question. Um, I don't know for sure of any examples. Um, my sense is that like maybe nursing and social work. I think there is some awareness and discussion, but I don't know if there are official, you know, statements of support. Does anybody else know of that? Um, Mandy, this is Tanya. Hi, everybody. Uh, so back in 2012, when the University of Northwestern St. Paul started our open initiative, um, you know, I, I was interested in if anyone would be interested. And so we proposed a session and there was like one session, you know, it was like pretty much mine. And then I went again last year and I think there were eight or nine. So this is the Higher Learning Commission. Um, and so textbook affordability and open ed um, definitely were gaining traction from, you know, 2012 to 2019 or 2018. Um, so I, I think at least from my perspective, uh, the accrediting bodies are talking about these kind of things. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. American Institute of Math has an OER recognition program. Yeah, Suzanne, yeah, I thought nursing was a lost cause too, but it sounds like there are some things going on. Yeah. If anybody knows of anybody else, please feel free to share. Um, at this point, we thought we would kind of reach out to you for some more ideas and feedback and kind of, you know, last month it worked so well with Lily and Cheryl uh, leading the discussion. We're kind of doing a similar thing today. So um, has anyone had success offering faculty incentives? And if so, what incentives have you tried that have worked? If anyone feels like sharing. Okay, regional accreditors for southeastern states have had open education programs at their edu annual meeting. It's promising. Can you hear me, Mandy, or anyone? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, so my internet is back. Uh, it's right on time. Hey. So I just wanted to say, if you wanna, if you want me to take some of this on. Oh, great! Yeah, I'll be quiet for some time now. <laughs> so I think we, the idea was that we were hoping to get the chat organized into some kind of a document um, to share with everyone, just like Cheryl and I did last month. So. If there is, if you are working on an incentive program um, of any kind, monetary or non-monetary, um, 
you know, and you feel like sharing with the community, please feel free to just describe it in just like a very, just like one line kind of message so that we can organize that. And then so we could have a little bit more of a resource as we're at the end of this presentation. So Gracie is uh, saying that they do have mini grants and larger grants. Um, so I'm curious to hear if you think those are going to continue going forward. Um, and uh, are they self-funded? Are they funded through the library? Um, any other detail if you want to share it would be great. Okay, and so there's some other types of ideas out there uh, for professional development, uh, like workshops, which is really good. Oh, and Gracie's adding that. Okay, so they're those departments are always, I don't know, most institutions. So maybe that's more, you know, type super, super fast or anything. Okay, so Arenthia is saying that she's, she's planning for mini grants and that the budget is allowing that at this time. That's very encouraging. And then Will has the alt textbook program. Um, Cheryl posed a really good question about uh, that I, I, I meant to cover, but I wasn't able to cover, which is what are these mini awards really for? Uh, are they for adoption versus creation? Um, and I'd love to discuss that a little bit. I know the mini grants that we offer are supposed to encompass both of these things but we do definitely see a trend towards adoption versus creation um, because of the obvious nature of you know giving faculty five hundred dollars probably isn't quite enough to push them over the edge to create and mandy feel free to chime in at any point too i don't mean to like silence you <laughs> because you did the whole presentation yourself. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm trying to give you a chance to speak since I hogged the mic the whole time. No, no, you didn't. You saved the day. I find it interesting that we have people who are kind of like, well, if we have funding, we'll have funding. Elaine has funding in quotes. We have funding. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's hard when there's so much uncertainty. It's hard to plan, you know, you want to be able to offer these sorts of things, but if you don't know if you can provide the funding, then it's really hard to know what to do. Oh, I see, Elaine, it's, it's because you can't call it a grant or an award, so it's just a fund. <laughs> Yeah, this, the, the language we use about these things has, has been very interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's great, Tanya. And I meant to add too, at some point in this presentation that there's some states, like I know Maryland, I know others um, that have funding for these kinds of things. Your just the institution has to apply and that would be one way to to go about it. Um, and I mean to make a list of what these states are, because I know that is a moving target. So if you are in a location that you know get some state funding for this, just chime in. That would be very helpful. You know, and, and honestly, as, as Mandy was talking, I kept thinking about how this is a good time to really be listening to departments because I just know, at least in my institution, 
a lot of departments are having really kind of deep, challenging conversations about their impact on students um, in this environment. I mean, literally Rutgers is getting sued by students right now because of the idea that the virtual instruction that is happening is just not going to cut it for students. It's not, they're not being supported enough. They're not being heard enough. And I just think it's a really important thing to be doing is to listen to the department and about the challenges that they're facing, which may be different from one department to the next. Um, because I, I do think that OER is, has an important sort of uh, moment right now within these affordability challenges. And it's actually, I don't know, I feel like I've been running an incentive award program for like five years almost now. And I'm kind of like, that has its limits, you know, um, that has its limits in terms of how far it can get. And I feel like there's deeper ways to engage with faculty that we can tap into now. Sorry, I just went on a little bit of a rant. So I'm just gonna go through the chat now. That's absolutely true. Lots of love for instructional designers in the chat. <laughs> Yay. Oregon State is doing more this year. That's wonderful. I don't know about you all, but we have some faculty right now who are just like, they went through this extremely frustrating experience of their students not being able to access things. And they're kind of like, whatever I got to do, I got to avoid that going forward. And like, those are the ones that we really want to, you know, bring in and say, well, let's talk about that. How can we make that easier? There are a lot of options that are much more affordable for your students. Oh, wow, Suzanne. Four instructional designers for 20,000 students. Mm -hmm. I'm sure right now they're just like tearing out their hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe as people add, Lily, can I go to the next question? Okay, I think this is, we've already been kind of talking about this, but um, since funding is so uncertain, do you all have ideas, things you've tried or heard about or came up with yourself of non-monetary incentives that you might, that we could consider? Yes, Arenthia, we got to preach OER while the students are, you know, especially struggling to access materials. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue of course reserves is really important. Um, it was always, I mean, it was always a problem, right? A problem of access in terms of how many students can access this biology 101 um, physically, right? And so now we are seeing the real issue here with buying print uh, copies, in fact, in my opinion. Um, so it's, um, it is something that, that we need to talk about, I feel like, in our departments is, you know, what is the value of print, print reserves going forward, knowing that this situation is not going to go away uh, anytime soon. Um, mm -hmm. It's also something to push back with, uh, with publishers, because we find that a lot of Faculty does use our ebooks for teaching materials, but uh, you know, there's not every book, first of all, not every book has an ebook version on purpose, right? And then there's also all of these issues about access simultaneously, et cetera. So it's, you know, I feel like it's a big time to rethink all of that stuff and try to, not that we haven't been trying to do something about it, but like really focus our efforts on fixing all of these contradictions. Yeah, I think some of our faculty didn't even realize that, that, that we had a print version of their textbook on reserve until it wasn't available anymore. <laughs> and then, then they were like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> and it was kind of panic time. So yes, food. I wish we could offer food. Um, this is a, an idea from, uh, this is an OTN idea that I got from in the past. Um, I think it came from Sarah. Anyways, um, if you can even just offer coffee to a faculty member to sit and chat with you about what's going on, you know, 
if you have some five dollar <laughs> coffee shop gift cards you know that always seemed like a fun idea to me like hey coffee's on me let's chat about the course materials that you've chosen or whatever or what's going on with your department um which you could totally do now still you could have an ego certificate and have a zoom meeting um that might be a really small incentive plus the opportunity to communicate have some human interaction that might be an incentive too So um, yes, there's an acknowledgement in the chat that OER doesn't have a lot of the quizzes, et cetera, which is a big problem for faculty. Yes, um, I mean, the way in which, uh, you know, the way in which I look at it or, or try to deal with it is to suggest including the students in doing some of that, creating some of that content. You know, you could do this with undergrad students, with grad students that you're working with. It really, it's, I think it's a hurdle to start doing it, but then once you start doing it, then it really just makes sense to continue, right? Because you have all of these reusable objects you can be plugging in. Yay, I'm glad that people are getting some ideas here. That's a great suggestion from Kayla to use the faculty learning circles to create these, especially if you're setting them up in a way that's disciplinary, discipline specific. Mm -hmm. I'm still stuck on Tanya's description of coffee, whipped cream, fancy <laughs> syrup. When can I have that? Faculty learning circles. Yeah. Did you have anything, Lily? Anything else? I didn't really say much yeah, about that. I, I had one underway, actually, um, and then we got closed down. Um, so we didn't, we never, I just canceled the virtual meetings because it was, it was March and it was not a good time for anybody to be thinking about this. But I plan to restart it in the fall. So the way in which I did it is I do have that uh, mini award program that I'm administering. So I basically sort of um, emailed, I guess, everybody who has received an award in the past. So it was a captive audience of people. And I said, hey, do you want to continue to talk about this? Do you want to meet for free lunch and again, food, right? And, um, and discuss the, you know, discuss open education, open pedagogy, essentially. And I got, I think about seven people to join. Um, so I do think that there's a lot of possibilities there. Obviously it didn't go through. So maybe somebody who's actually running a real one that did go through can talk about it. But I do think it's a, it's an element of community that faculty doesn't necessarily have. They don't really, especially, I mean, at least in my campus, I can't speak for everybody, but we have a problem with talking about teaching. Like everybody talks about their research all the time, uh, but what you do in the classroom is just like not talked about very much here. And so I do think that there's a, a, a little bit of a area where we could step in um, and promote discussions about teaching and specifically teaching affordably or with OER. I don't, not to put you on the spot, Cheryl, but it sounds like Cheryl had, has some experience a learning circle if you wanted to share sure yeah so we started an oer uh, learning community in the fall and uh, did that for two semesters and talked about kind of the basics of oer where to find them uh, how creative commons licenses work um, about copyrights and there were a lot of questions about what they can and can't use in their courses and in how OER um, kind of uh, 
meshes in the course material world with library license materials. Uh, we also got into open pedagogy, and I think that would be a great topic for a learning community. That's of all of the OER press books topics um, that I've talked about with faculty, um, they seem most excited about the open pedagogy. And so we had 40 uh, people sign up this summer for an introductory press books session, and then 20 sign up for the advanced session. So um, yeah, we're today we're tackling H5P. Last last week we did hypothesis and how that integrates into press books. So there are a lot of kind of OER related topics that faculty are super interested in learning about and diving into and experimenting with. Is there is there any monetary incentive for those or are they just volunteer? No, there's there's no monetary incentive and we have no budget for food. We have no budget whatsoever. <laughs> we we were able to tap into the existing um, faculty learning community network that campus operates. And so they provide some marketing support and website support. Uh, but no, it's it's totally volunteer. And I have to say it has been a lot of work <laughs> to organize it and and get the content and, and answer the questions, but it surfaced people that we had no idea were interested in OER. And now they're creating open textbooks in press books and planning open pedagogy projects for fall. So um, it's been totally worth the work. And both times I've partnered with other people. So for the, the OER, I partnered with a nutritional sciences um, instructor. And this summer for press books, I partnered with someone in our digital learning division. And so having those additional perspectives and contacts has been great. Thanks, Cheryl. It's amazing. Yeah. Also, Meg has a great idea in here about kind of allowing faculty who have finished an open project to work with those who have expressed interest. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. You know, I think faculty are much more likely to listen to each other than to listen to me. Very good. Well, we have one other slide. Um, we have like four minutes left. So, Lily, I don't know if we want to have a few comments about this one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly on my mind. Uh, I'm sure that it is, it is on others' minds too, because, you know, we sit through all of these WebEx Zoom meetings all day long, and that is kind of the only way, I guess, we can meet with <laughs> faculty um, in lieu of, you know, going out to coffee, which would be much better. So I'm just wondering, you know, what tools have other people used to reach out at this point? present moment and it sounds like Cheryl is doing something very successful with faculty um, you know what who else has tried different methods of communicating just even getting people's attention is just quite challenging right now So yes, yeah, so uh, positioning OER as a tool for increasing accessibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's, yes, it's always has been. And so it is so critical right now that we really make this point in any way that we can, because then faculty will want to meet with us in Zoom, even though they've been Zoomed out all day long. So that is so true. And then Meg is adding that they're embedding all the faculty development efforts by our IT department and our Center for Teaching and Assessment and Learning. So you're collaborating. Okay, that's wonderful. Yes, because, right, 
those units are going to have faculty's attention absolutely in the summer. Okay, and then there's some weekly emails that have been effective. I'm assuming VPAA is high level administrator at the library or above. Maybe vice president academic affairs, maybe? That's what it is. <laughs> I bet that's what it I is. I don't know. Um, yeah, constant nudging. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. I guess right. Yeah. Yeah, I like the idea of kind of rolling it into copyright and just helping them deal with a lot of the challenges that they're dealing with now. Absolutely. Well, we have three minutes left. So if anyone has other ideas, on that question or just other ideas in general or questions for the group. Yes, well put, Tanya. Yeah, put in course reserves emails. Yeah, that's a good idea, Cheryl an OER webinar as part of moving to online teaching or just fold it into a webinar just generally like how do we how do your students need to access things right now and while you're here let me tell you about open resources yeah all right well I, this is pretty much all we had. Thank you so much for sharing your comments in the chat, your ideas with everybody. I think that's where we get some of the richest content uh, from these uh, discussions comes from the chat. And I'm, I'm sure I can speak for Lily in saying we're very happy to follow up with, you know, if you have questions after this or ideas you want to bounce off of us, here are our email addresses. Yes, and sorry again about all the issues. <laughs> it is what it is, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but um, I, I definitely learned a lot from everybody here and I hope that we can keep each other in mind, especially, you know, it's gonna be an interesting year. So I think we need all of the ideas we can possibly hear at this point. Gotta get creative. <laughs> So give us a few days and I'll make sure that the transcript, you know, is, is uh, organized and we've got the video up. Um, and I think that the slide deck is already up, but it'll all be um, there under the video instruction part of our course site. Um, and so thank you. Thanks, Mandy, for stepping in. Um, and we will uh, see you guys later. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone.